Good morning from Fresh Start. What a blessing it is to be back in the house of the Lord. Uh, we appreciate another opportunity to stand and do the Father's will. Uh, we are here in our Hosea study this morning, and we're going to finish all of the book of Hosea today. Uh, we have three chapters yet, and uh, we don't want you to turn it off because of the length of time. So, uh, But yet, it will take just a moment to go through all these uh, verses, but uh, we feel that... Uh, there's not enough left in chapter 14 and that to start over. So uh, that being said, uh, while you're getting your Bibles and turning with us this morning, we'll ask Father for his blessing. Precious Father, we come to you thanking you for another blessed day. Thank you, Father, for each and every one that listens, Father, and participates in this Bible study. We ask, Father, that your word would land on fertile ground. Father, we thank you again for all that you do. In the precious name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Hosea chapter 12, Hosea meaning salvation, that's what Father uh, is trying to explain uh, through all of his chapter here that uh, he has salvation for his children, has salvation for those that uh, will uh, accept him. And uh, we ask that you would be open-minded to the word of God and realize that there's a lot of history that will be recorded and uh, re-recorded and uh, things that will be said that will bring your mind back to things that you've read thus far. So starting at, uh, we're going to start on verse 12 of chapter 11. And the reason why we're starting on verse 12, chapter 11, because it was misplaced. It wasn't placed properly. It should have been uh, the first verse in chapter 12, although they left it in chapter 11, the last verse. And the reason why I say that is because of the significant subject change. And so we'll read verse 12. It says, Ephraim compasseth me about with lies, and the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah yet ruleth with God and is faithful with the saints. Again, this is a subject change from what we have read to chapter 11. And uh, Israel and Ephraim both are in jeopardy with Father at this point. Uh, but yet it says, Judah yet ruleth with God and is faithful with the saints. And uh, there's a little controversy in the, the latter part of that verse, and we'll get on that here in just a moment. In verse number 1 in chapter number 12, and it reads, Ephraim feedeth on wind, and followeth after the east wind. He daily increaseth lies and desolation, and they do make a covenant with the Assyrians, and oil is carried into Egypt. And again, there's a lot of history involved in here, and We'll take this latter part first. It says that, uh, and oil is carried into Egypt. And uh, it, it, it's not a mysterious thing to think that Father would know that there is no oil in Egypt, uh, knowing that all oil must be carried into Egypt. And that's, Father understood that. Why is it that Father understands it? It's because God made all things. He made it all, and he knew that there was no oil there. But it's saying here that, Ephraim feedeth on wind, and followeth after the east wind. Ephraim feedeth on hot air. That's what he's saying. And he's saying that, and followeth after the east wind, the, the, the hot, dry east wind. Now, this is not the ruash, but this is the east wind uh, uh, that comes from the desolate place. And uh, he daily increaseth in lies and desolation. How come he continues to increase in lies and desolation. It's because of what he is being taught. It's because of what he is hearing. And they do make a covenant with the Assyrians. When you listen to ministers or teachers that are not of God, that's what you will hear. You will hear nothing but hot air, and you'll hear their ideas and uh, their uh, complaint, 
per se about the Word of God. Many times you'll find ministers that will search out scriptures in a book that lifts up the crowd, but they won't teach what the subject is. They will not teach the full chapter, and that's like the Assyrians, uh, those that are not of God, and oil is carried into Egypt. In uh, Hosea 8 and 7, it says, For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stalk, the bud shall yield no meal. If so be it yield, the strangers shall swallow it up. And who are these strangers? These strangers are uh, your Kenites. So we know that it's a true proclamation about Ephraim and Israel. Verse 2. The Lord hath also a controversy with Judah. Now see, this is the reason why I say that the latter part of verse 12 in chapter 11 is not correctly written. Latter part of 12, it says, But Judah yet ruleth with God and is faithful with the saints. But here in verse 2 of chapter 12, it says, The Lord hath a controversy with Judah and will punish Jacob. Uh, when, when Father mentions Jacob in these uh, scriptures, he's talking about all 12 tribes. And he says, um, I will punish Jacob according to his ways. According to his doings uh, will he recompense him. In other words, punishment's coming, Jacob. Punishment is coming, all 12 tribes of Israel. Three, he took his brother by the heel uh, in the womb... And by his strength, he had power with God. I'm going to read four also. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spoke with us. Fathers turned here now to Jacob as a personage, not as the uh, 12 tribes of Israel, but he says, He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. We know that Jacob, being in election, how do you say that? Well, we know that in Ephesians 1 in chapter 4, it plainly states, Chapter 1 and verse 4, it plainly states, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Knowing that Jacob was an election of father, let me go on a little further and say in, in the book of Malachi, uh, chapter 1, in verse, I believe it's uh, 23. Malachi 1 and 23. Excuse me. Malachi 1 and 3. And it reads, I'm going to read 2 also. He says, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I love Jacob? Three, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. So for father to have hated Esau means that we must go back to the first earth age, knowing that what Esau done in the first earth age, and back in Hosea 12 and 3 and 4, we see that he had power with God, and uh, he prevailed over uh, God, or the angel at the time. Uh, and that's what uh, that means, is that, uh, the heel grabber, the prince that prevails uh, with God. Uh, you can read about that in Genesis chapter 32. But he says here, yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him, this is the part I like. He found him in Bethel, in a place where it was desolate, 
in leaving Syria and going to Gilgal, into the mountains of Gilgal, Father found him in Bethel. He found him in the house of God. And there he spoke with us. But the problem with this is, is that Jacob, Israel today, they wax fat. And they have no desire in that to speak with God. You say, well, now you don't know that. Well, no, I don't know that. But you can see the result in the lifestyle of the people that were around us today. Very few uplift God. Very few uh, put God first in their equation. Very few uh, honor the Father. And it says there in uh, <clears throat> he said there in the latter part, he said, and he found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. Verse 5, even the Lord God of hosts, the Lord is his memorial. In other words, that's his name. Um, in Exodus chapter 6, you can see there where Moses is speaking with Father. And let me get to it here. He, Moses, he, he, excuse me, Exodus chapter 6. <clears throat> and verse 3. We can go about verse, uh, let's read verse 1. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go. And with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. Two. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. Three. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but by my name, Yahweh, was I known, was I not known to them. They did not know that his holy name was Yahweh, Elohim, the God of provision. So we see here that in verse 6, he said, Therefore turn thou to thy God. Turn therefore, excuse me, therefore turn thou to thy God. Keep mercy and judgment and wait on thy God continually. He said here in 6, he said, Therefore turn thou to thy God. That's exactly what Father wants. He wants his children to turn to him and not go to the counsel of men. Not go to the counsel of a, a, a study guide, but turn to God. I've had more people ask me this question. How is it that you understand the word of God? You must study God's word. You must use the correct tools. And you must pray that the Holy Spirit guide you. Without the Holy Spirit and the guidance of that of the Father... Being in the will of the Father, you'll never understand God's word. Therefore, he said, Therefore, turn thou to thy God. Keep mercy. In other words, keep love. And judgment. Judgment is to do the right thing. In other words, keep your love and do the right thing. Then what did he say? And wait on thy God continually. Oh, so we're not supposed to jump on the first bandwagon that comes by. No, sir. So we're not supposed to take the first Christ that comes to deliver us. No, sir. How is it that we're not supposed to take it? Because God has told us throughout all his word that there is a great Assyrian coming. A type of the Assyrian that took captive the children of Israel. In the same concept, we will have to, in an analogy take the Assyrian and place him as the Antichrist, the one that comes before Christ. We are to wait on him. We are to wait upon the Lord. Verse 7. 
he, he being Ephraim, he is a merchant. The balance of deceit are in his hand. He loveth to oppress. Sad. It's sad to think that our people would take advantage uh, of somebody if they had the opportunity. God sees all things, friends. God sees every transaction that goes by, and God knows uh, exactly who it is that one is, well, taking advantage of uh, and who is being taken advantage of. It says, he is a merchant. You know what he's calling him here? <laughs> he's calling him a Kenite. He's a merchant. The balances of deceit are in his hand. He's got his hand on the weight, on the side of, of, of himself. In other words, he is making it better for himself. Kind of like the uh, oppression that we have today with, uh, with the rising cost of everything coming and going. Who all is uh, getting money in their pockets? Who is it that's putting money into their pockets? It's surely not uh, God's children. It would have to be those that are deceitfully taking advantage uh, of the situation. He said, he is a merchant, and the balance of deceit are in his hand. He loveth to oppress. I read that latter part of the verse, and I think of some poor old man or poor old woman that only has so much. And they end up taking every bit of it that they can and really could care less about the individual, could care less about the woman or the man, but worried more about the money that's going in their pockets. Verse 8. And Ephraim said, Yet I am become rich. I have found me out substance. In all my labors they shall find none iniquity in me that were sin. Ephraim here in this verse exalts himself. Kind of sounds like Ezekiel chapter 28, doesn't it? How that Satan said, I will uh, exalt myself above the throne of God. I will be like the Most High. They've left God out of the equation. They don't realize that it is God that has given them these riches. It has got, now, let me say this. There's nothing wrong with having wealth. Wealth is a wonderful thing if it's done the right way. If it's not taken through deceit, if it's not taken through uh, ways of uh, taking advantage of a man or a woman, when God brings on the blessings, friends, it's because you've done things right. I think about how it was when the men were working in the field in the book of Ruth. How that when they were working, they looked up and seen Boaz coming. And Boaz, first thing he says was, bless are thee because of the work they're doing. And they turned around and said, no, blessed are you that Father has given to you. You see how that works? The blessings come because we treat one another the way that Father wants us to treat one another. Riches are not to come because of the way that you found a loophole to take money from someone. He said in eight for, and Ephraim said, yet I am becoming rich. I have found me out substance. In all my labors, they shall find none iniquity in me that were sin. It's not the they that they should be worried about. It's not man that they should be worried about. It's father that keeps great records. He keeps wonderful records, friends. And unless one has repented, they stay on the chart. Verse 9. And I, that am the Lord thy God, from the land of Egypt, will yet make thee to dwell in tabernacles, as in the days of the solemn feast. Father will, in that day, he will 
allow people to, individuals, I'm saying in the millennial, that will have to dwell in tents at that time, have to dwell in, in houses. But it goes on here, it says in verse 10, I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multitude, excuse me, I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. God says here that I have sent you prophets, and I have multiplied the visions, and used similitudes, in other words, types, by the ministry of the prophets. What did Christ tell us in Mark 13, 23? Take heed, for I have foretold you all things. Why would it be that Christ has said that? Well, what is Christ? The word is Christ. Christ is the Word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. So Christ has plainly said in Mark 13, 23, that he has foretold us all things. In other words, his prophets that have come have laid it out plainly. There are no excuses, friends. It's either on the right side or on the wrong side. Father's keeping great record. 11, is there iniquity in Gilead? Question, surely they are vanity. They sacrifice bullocks to Gilgal. Yea, their altars are as heaps in the furrows of the fields. And that's what Father thinks of their, of their altars. Let me ask you, do you know what a furrow is? A furrow is where you take a plow and you make a rut into the ground. In other words, the ground is open and it's a, a ditch, per se. Now, if there's heaps in the furrows, what's that tell you? That somebody has planted something deceiving in the furrows. I mean, you can look out there and see all of them furrows ready to be planted, and you look and you say, well, what is that out there? Is that heaps out there in the furrows? How did that happen? It happened because of the way that Ephraim does their work. They like to take a man's idea, as long as it fascinates the crowd, they'll take a man's idea and run with it. It's not God's word. It's nothing of God. And that's what he's saying here. He said, uh, their altars are as heaps. In the, feral, in the furrows of the field. Verse 12. And Jacob fled into the country of Syria, and Israel served for a wife. And for a wife he kept sheep. And he did. He did the right thing. In a time when he was away from his family, away from his father and mother, he could have done anything he wanted to do. But what did he do, Jacob? He done the right thing. He served for his wife. Verse 13. And by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. Now, by a prophet, being Moses, who brought them out? The Lord brought them out of Israel. It wasn't Moses. Moses is only a, 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 a work for God. It was God's wonderful hand that brought the children of Israel out of bondage. And by a prophet was he preserved. Verse 14. Ephraim provoked him to anger most bitterly. Therefore shall he leave his blood upon him and his reproach shall his Lord return unto him. It's all because of repentance. All because they will not repent. He said, uh, therefore shall he leave his blood, this word blood is the guilt, upon him. So he'll leave his guilt upon him. How do you get rid of guilt? How do you do away with the guilt in your life? You must come to the Father through repentance. Repentance. You can't just come and say, I'm sorry. Sorry just doesn't do it. 
there must be a, a 180 turn to get completely away from the situation you were in. Although Ephraim will not do that. Not at this time. <clears throat> Chapter 13 and verse 1, and it reads, When Ephraim spake trembling, he exalted himself in Israel. But when he offended in Baal, he died. <laughs> of course he died. From what? From Baal worship. When one is involved in idolatry and uh, worship, that of gods that are not of God, you say, well, now, Brother Randall, hold on a minute. You're talking about back in those days. That, that, that's not even a uh, comparison to today, is it? Yes, it is. Because Baal worship is still Baal worship. If you want to say it's uh, for the children, uh, uh, we do Easter because of the children. And, and we bring a, 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 a uh, uh, we bring a, a bunny rabbit into the church and uh, it's called because of the children. Friends, people need to realize what God is upset about. God is upset because people have taken the holy days, the holy feasts, the times that Father has exalted in his word and changed it through Baal worship and allowed their people to exalt themselves in a spirit that's not God. Verse 2, And now they sin more and more, and have made them molten images of their silver, and their idols uh, according to their own understanding. All of it, the work of the craftsmen, they say of them, let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves. There's a lot here in verse 2. He said, and now thy sin, they sin more and more. And they do because they do not understand. They do not know that when they go to a Beth of Vien, uh, that they are sinning. They do not know that when they give their tithes and their offerings and their love and their work and their help, to a Beth of Inn, uh, that they are offending Father. They think they're doing God a service, but they're not. He said, it made them molten images of their silver and their idols according to their own understanding. <laughs> not the understanding that Father's brought out, but to their own understanding. Well, that's just how I interpret it. Uh, I, uh, we interpret it a little different over here. We look at it, friend, there's only one way to interpret the word of God. It's what thus saith the word of God. It's not about a man's opinion. It's not about a woman's idea. It's about what God says. And we are to follow uh, what God says. And if we don't, well, expect your gourd to be thumped. That's the way the Lord looks at it. <clears throat> to their own understanding, and all of it, the work of the craftsman. And it wasn't of God. It was a, a craft work of somebody, of some man. God did not bring out a rapture theory. God did not bring out anything near a rapture theory. It was all a man's idea. And they say to them, let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves. There's no help in a substitute like the calves. The two calves were brought in by Jeroboam for a reason. The reason was for a substitute. So that the people wouldn't leave the city and go and give all of their alms and all of their time to Jerusalem. Even the children of Israel knew that it was wrong, but yet they did it. Verse number three. Therefore, they shall be as the morning cloud, as the early dew that passeth away, 
as the chaff that is driven with the whirlwind out of the floor and as the smoke out of the chimney. Father wraps it all up right there. Therefore, they shall be as the morning cloud. What does the morning cloud do for you? Gives you false hope. Gives you false hope thinking that you're going to have showers that day, but there's not. When the heat comes, uh, it burns off. The same way uh, when the heat comes uh, from the Antichrist, uh, they're not going to be able to stand. They're not going to know where to go. They're not going to know what to do. They're going to assume to travel right after the Antichrist. And as the early dew that passeth away, as the chaff that is driven from the whirlwind out of the floor, out of the threshing floor, all that dust and all of the chaff that just blows away, that's what happens to them. And as the smoke out of the chimney. Have you ever noticed how far you can watch the smoke in the chimney? It won't be very far. It'll go up just a little ways and then it's gone. It's the same way that of Ephraim. Verse 4. Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt, not, thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Savior besides me. Many of our brothers and sisters in Christ that want to attach themselves to the body of Christ, they do things because they're unlearned. They do not know. They do not know that they are following after traditions of man. They do not know that they are following Baal worship. They do not know these things. Why is it? Because they've never got into his word. They've never sat down and studied God's word whatsoever. Or at least listened to a teacher that would make sense. But yet, they're in fault. For there is no Savior besides me. God is the only one. God is the only one that offers. And God is the only one that can save. Satan's going to come as the Antichrist. And at the sixth trump, he's going to come and say that he is the Savior of the world. He is the Messiah, but he's a liar. He's a liar and the father of it. And many will follow after him because they do not know. They do not understand. And again, that's why this ministry is here. And many ministries like this one are here to help people, charging not one dime, not wanting anybody to feel left out, but for everybody to be able to come to the knowledge of the truth and be prepared for that day. There's a day coming, friends. Five, I did know thee in the wilderness, in the land of great drought. God knew them, and he provided everything for them. Everything from the manna to uh, the cloud that covered them from the heat and from the pillar of fire that protected them at night even the manna that came down from heaven, the quail. And the Bible goes on the far as to say is that they wandered for 40 years in the wilderness and their clothes and their shoes never wore. God provided, friends. God loved, loved Israel. Verse 6, according to their pasture, so were they filled. They were filled and their heart was exalted. Therefore, have they forgotten me? Every time things begin to go good, we have history in this nation. Problems come about, and people start to turn to God. They begin to worship the Lord and begin to flood the house of God. But once the things are settled and it's not as bad as it was. 
they begin to forget God. And they get back out there in the world. And they begin to live uh, without God. Many times in our nation, we have seen that happen. This nation and many of the Christian nations that have forsaken God, there's going to be a judgment. Six, according to their pasture, so were they filled. And they were filled and their heart was exalted. Your pasture is where you eat. Your pasture is where you are fed. Therefore, have they forgotten me? Prayer keeps us close to the Father. A prayer on a daily basis keeps you close to God. Many children of God speak to the Lord quite often in most everything that they do, in direction, in guidance, in counsel, in many things that they have need of. But I guess the question would be, how is your prayer life this morning? How is the prayer life that you have with Father? Do you have a personal relationship with him? We truly hope you do. The people that study along the lines that they ought to, those students that have studied the word of God and are enjoying studying God's word, you have a relationship with the Father. But many have no desire. Many have not been instilled in them to get up on a Sunday and dedicate some time to God, be it going to the house of the Lord or to study. Many just go on their merry way. And they don't understand why things happen in their lives. Let me say this, that prayer keeps you from experiencing majority of the problems of this world. You say, well, yeah, uh, I can see that. But we did pray after this situation happened, and that's, that, that happens. People are in that situation, and, you know, bad things happen. But I'm telling you that if we were to be honest with God, and have a communication with Father, many things would be knocked out of the way. Many trials and tribulations and problems would be out of the way. Why is that? God said, I chasten those that I love. So how is your prayer life, friend? I pray that it's where it needs to be. Amen. Verse 7. Therefore, I will be unto them as a lion, as a leopard, by the way, will I observe them. <laughs> wow. Just wait. Just waiting. And many do get out of line. Many do have problems. Many do have uh, situations in their life. From sicknesses to incarceration to uh, debt and things of that nature. And it's all because of not listening to the counsel of God. Not taking it before the Lord. Handling it on their own. Verse 8. I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved of her whelps. And will rend the cow of their heart. And there will I devour them like a lion. The wild beast shall tear them. There's a recompense. And it's a law. The law is if you throw it up, it's going to come back down. That's the law. If you do evil in the sight of the Lord, there's going to be consequences. The Father said, I will meet them as a bear that has bereaved of her whelps. And I will rend the cow of their heart. God will break their hearts. 
Many of you have had your heart broken. And through situations in our lives, we learn from this. We learn when our hearts are broken. I'm not just talking about when God kind of puts a little something on you and kind of brings you back to it. I'm talking when he breaks your heart. It's a sad situation. But Father loves you. Father cares for his children. Which one does he care for, Brother Randall? <laughs> he cares equally for all of his children. Verse 9. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. You've done it to yourself, Israel. Israel has done it thinking that they are doing God a service. Well, I, 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 I wanted my children to go to the nicest church in town, and I wanted my children to uh, experience uh, the, the right things. The right things are the things that are talked about during the soccer game. <laughs> where do you go to church? Oh, well, where do you go to church? Oh, well, we go so-and-so, and, and we have this and that, and we do this and that. But do you learn anything? Do you know the Word of God? Are you preparing your children for the coming of the Lord? Are you preparing your children for the tribulation that is fixing to come upon mankind? They destroyed themselves. But in me is thine help. That is the answer to it all. The only way that you're going to have help, and I don't mean through uh, monetary value or uh, through anything other than the help of God. God will be the one that will direct the life of an individual and help that individual. Some are coming out of bondage. Some are coming out of Babylon in confusion and they're waking up and they're beginning to wake up and see that Father loves them far more than any minister has ever tried to exalt through a message. I'm talking about how Father can speak to the spirit of an individual. He loves you and he cares. Verse 10. I will be thy king. Where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities? Question. And thy judges of whom thou saidest, give me a king and princes. <laughs> God said, I'll be your king. You don't need a king. Although that's what the people wanted. That's exactly what they wanted. They wanted to trust in the arm of flesh. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5. Let's just read that right there real quick. Jeremiah 17 and verse number 5. Thus saith the Lord. Now this is what God says. Thus saith the Lord. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh his flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. They trust in more of a man than they do God. They wanted somebody that they could pat on the back. They wanted somebody that they could touch instead of God. Verse 11, I give thee a king in mine anger and took him away in my wrath. <laughs> this brings my mind to Colossians. Let me turn to Colossians real quick. In the book of Colossians, chapter <clears throat> number 1, Start reading about verse 15. 
Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. There's not a king that's ever sat on a throne that God didn't put there. You say, well, now, there's been some pretty evil ones now, Brother Randall. God put them there. For the negative plan that God had. God's got a plan. And if you can get wrapped into his plan and understand his plan, friends, you've got it. 17. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So it's by God that brought in this. That's what he said in verse 11. I give thee a king in mine anger. It made him mad. It made him jealous. <laughs> he said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Well, this king Saul, he wasn't a god, was he? That's how they treated him. They looked more to him than they did God. Verse 12, the iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is hid. The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. It's all sealed up. It's exactly what it is. But Moffat, James Moffat, gives a translation. In this latter part, it says, his sins is kept in store for him. They're never repented because they do not know to repent. They do not know that they're doing wrong. They assume that they are doing correctly. Verse 13, the sorrows of a travailing woman shall come upon him. He is, a, he is, as, he is an unwise son, for he should not stay long in the place of breaking forth of children. The sorrows of a travailing woman shall come upon him. And it will in this final generation. Mark 13 and verse 17, it says, Woe to them that are with child and them that give suck in those days. Again, they do not know that they are to wait upon the Lord. They go whoring after the first Christ that comes along. They do not know that there's going to be another one that shows up, which is the true Christ. He is, as, he is an unwise son. For he should not stay long in the place of breaking forth of children. John chapter 3. John chapter 3 plainly tells us how that we are to understand how that we are born. Verse 2 in chapter 3 he said the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles uh, that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, uh, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Do not take any man's word For the explanation here. This explanation, born again, it means to be born from above. If you want to check this teacher out, look in your Strong's in the Greek 509. And it says that the word again means from above. 
so what is he saying here? He's saying here that for he should not stay long uh, in the place of breaking forth of children. They do not want to be born from above. Neither do they not just want to be born from above. They don't want to be born of the Spirit. But they don't want to recognize it. They explain it away. They say that 1 Corinthians 5 and 17 says that if any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. They try to, to put that in place of being born again. And that's not what God is saying here. Verse 4 in John chapter 3, he said, Nicodemus says unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time in his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, verse 5, Truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He gives a criteria here of one that must come through the womb of a woman. Being born of water means being capulated in the womb of a woman. But don't ever let somebody take away this beautiful concept that you come from the Father. When did you come in? <laughs> That's the thing. When? He said here in Matthew chapter 20, let me turn here to Matthew chapter 20. Christ has plainly said, In Matthew chapter 20 and verse 16, So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, uh, but few chosen. God is plainly trying to explain to you and I that there is a reason why we are here. There is a reason why you have been chosen to come through in this latter day. You've been held out for the latter day battle. Yeah, there's going to be a battle. It's not going to be of guns and, and bombs and things of that. It's going to be of the mind. And God wants you to be wise enough to understand. Never let somebody try to explain the way of being born again. It really bothers this minister because it takes away from the beauty that Father has of giving all of us an individual opportunity to come through this flesh age, but at a special time. And it was God that done that. Not your mother, not your father, but it was God. So, back in chapter 13 and verse 13, the sorrows of a travailing woman shall come upon him. He is as an unwise son. For he shall not stay long uh, in the place of breaking forth of children. Can't wait to get it over with. Let me move on. Verse 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. It'll be too late then. It'll be too late for repentance. Because the Lord will have already came. And this shocker will run across the face of every individual. And what will they say? Cry unto the mountains that they cover us from this God. Cover us. We pray that we could die, but they can't die. Why is that? Well, because uh, 1 Corinthians 15 52, they've already dropped the flesh. And there is no dying of the Spirit unless it's done by Father. Verse 15. Though he be fruitful among his brethren, an east wind shall come. Now, this east wind is not what we read in verse 1 of chapter 12, this is the Ruosh. Though he be fruitful among his brethren, an east wind shall come. The wind of the Lord shall come up, up from the wilderness. 
and his spring shall become dry, and his fountain shall be dried up. He shall spoil the treasure of all pleasant vessels. Who is this he? This is the Antichrist. It says here that he shall spoil the treasures of all of the vessels. <laughs> Let me read to you what it says here in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12. Revelations 12 and 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens. Rejoice because uh, Satan and his angels have been kicked out of heaven. So rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath. Why? Because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. That's why all of the treasures and everything will be spoiled. That's why all of the wonderful blessings that have been brought out to the Americas and all of the other Christian nations will be taken. Why is that? Because of the Antichrist. It's been prophesied. The Father's already seen it happen. This is exactly how it's going to happen. Verse 16. Samaria shall become desolate. Now, this is uh, the capital of Israel in that day. He said that Samaria shall become desolate, for she hath rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword. Their infants uh, shall be dashed in pieces, and their women uh, shall be ripped up. And I know this is sounding pretty radical, but what he's saying here is, is that exactly what he said in chapter 1. What did Father tell Hosea to do in chapter 1? <clears throat> in verse number 2, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said unto Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms. These children of whoredoms... Uh, are those that do not know who their father is. They've been through this life, but they have no idea who their father is. They don't want to accept being born from above. They don't want to accept that. Therefore, they do not know. He said, their infants shall be dashed in pieces, and their women uh, with child shall be ripped up. And this women with child is the same concept as we said in uh, Mark 13, verse 17. Woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. He's not speaking directly to a woman. He's speaking to a Christian, a, a, a chaste virgin, supposedly. A parable that is spoken about in Matthew chapter 25. There were five that were wise and five that were foolish. Chapter 14, now we see the sovereignty of God, the love that God has for Israel. O oh, Israel, return unto thy Lord, thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. When you see this, O oh, Israel, when you see Father speaking, oh, he's doing everything to get the attention of Israel. He's pleading, oh, Israel, return unto the Lord thy God. My mind thinks about what Stephen said unto the eunuch. The eunuch asked him, he said, how must I know lest some man tell me? I said that to say this, it's our responsibility. It's those that understand God's words and his plan. It's our responsibility to go and to help and to bring those out of bondage. Return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. What's the iniquity, Brother Randall? What's their sin? For not studying the word of God. 
not preparing themselves. This is a love letter that God has written to you and I. Mine's getting a little old and getting a little worn. But I tell you what, I wouldn't trade it for anything of this world. Have many valuables in my home. My home were to be on fire and I could go in there, this would be the one thing I'd get because it means that much to me. Now, that's just random. The desires of an individual should be that of the Word of God. You say, well, you should have God's Word all tucked away in your mind. Well, I, I've got a lot of it tucked away, but it does have a help to be able to go across it and to read it. It's precious to me. Verse 2, he said, take with you words. <laughs> take with you words? Yeah, take with you the Word of God and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves of our lips. So will we render those thoughts that we had of the substitution. Verse 3. Asher shall not save us. Now this word Asher has no article here. This should be the Assyrian. This should be the Antichrist. He said, <clears throat> in other words, let's read it that way. The Antichrist shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our, own, our hands. Uh, ye are our gods, uh, for in thee uh, the fatherless find mercy. The fatherless find mercy. The fatherless find love. In chapter 1, Father told Hosea to marry a harlot. And the harlot's name was Gomer, which means completion. In other words, full to the measure of iniquity. That's what Gomer means. And then they had a son, and his name was Jezreel. Now, this is the latter part of the meaning of Jezreel. For the first part was May God scatter. That's the first part of Jezreel. The second part of Jezreel is may God sow. And that's exactly what he's done here in verse 3. Neither will you say any more to the work of your hands. Ye are our gods, for in thee the fatherless find mercy. In other words, may God sow. Verse 4. I will heal their backsliding. In other words, their forsaking of God. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from me. Is this in the near future, Brother Randall? This is in the millennial. This is when Ephraim gets an eye opener. This was when Ephraim recognizes that they have followed the wrong one all of their life. Five, I will be as the dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. I will be the dew unto Israel. This dew is your most purest of waters that comes down from the heavens. And it waters our grounds while we uh, are asleep. That's the same way that God will work in that day. He will bring forth water for you and I. He will rain upon you and I as the dew. He shall grow as a lily and cast forth as the roots of Lebanon. Six, his branches shall spread and his beauty shall be as the olive tree and his smell as Lebanon. You know what the smell of Lebanon is? It's cedar. What's cedar do? It keeps away all of the bad things. That's why you make your hope chest from cedar or uh, you have a closet lined with cedar. You keep away all the things that want to destroy. And that's what he's saying here. And his smell as Lebanon. Verse 7. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. This is a very important verse. 
It's so important that people need to know this verse. Because he said, they that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. It says here, they shall revive as the corn. You ever seen how the corn will get knocked down through a bad storm? But friend, when that sun comes back out, it'll all stand back up. It will revive itself. That's what Father's talking about. They'll grow as the vine. Many times you can see a vine like a, a morning glory or something of that nature. and You can just watch that thing almost crawl upside of a wall or up, uh, upside something. And, and it just continues to grow and it moves more and more every day. That's exactly what he's talking about. And the scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon, a beautiful wine. Verse 8, Ephraim shall say, what have I to do any more with idols? And this will be in the millennial. He says, What have I to do any more with traditions of man? What have I any more to do with these? That's true. Because God will be their God in that day. And there will be no substitutions. There will be no two calves. There will be no traditions of man. There'll be nothing to disturb or mislead. It'll all be pure. I have heard him and observed him. I am like a green fir tree. From me is thy fruit found. I am like a green fir tree. God is is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. God does not change, friends. It's man that changes. It's people that change. God does not change. That's why he called himself a green fir tree. Even in the most desolate times, when the weather is so cold and it's bleak and it's stormy outside and the skies are gray and it's cold, that fir tree will still be standing green. That's exactly how Father is. Wouldn't you much rather follow after something that is real than something that is not real? It's more rewarding to follow Father because of his love and his ability to give to his children than to have false hope and to follow after something of man. From me is thy fruit found. This is true. That's why Christ said, you'll know a tree by the fruit that it bears. I, I, I would love to think that God's students, those that are studying, are like a fruit tree that has wonderful fruit upon it. A fruit for anybody to take and to utilize. He said, Christ did, he said, you'll know a tree by the fruit that it bears, be it good or bad. He said, for a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. And a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. It's so important that we try to help our friends and our families to come to the knowledge of the truth. Verse number nine to come to a close. Who is wise? <laughs> That's a question by Father. Who is wise and he shall understand these things? Question. Prudent. In other words, gifted. And he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. A beautiful statement. In Psalms 37, it 
It has an acrostic. And in other words, it's speaking about ponder not why the wicked prosper. He said in the latter part here, he said, For the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. Let's read in Psalms 37 real quick. Verse number 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Verse 8. <coughs> Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Verse 9. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. So often, we say that we are to wait upon the Lord, not to entertain an any moment doctrine, not to entertain a flyaway theory, not to even be involved in any of that nonsense, but to do what? To wait upon the Lord. That's all of Hosea, and that is the salvation of the Lord. That's what God has done. He has brought forth in his words how that his children have fallen and how they have listened to traditions of man, how they have been taken captive by the Assyrian. Many people are really ripe on the vine for the Assyrian. Many people are really ripe on the vine for the Antichrist. But not you, my friend. You have studied and you have learned that we are to do what? To wait upon the Lord. It's been a wonderful study. Hosea has been a wonderful study for us to, to realize that man has gone astray. And God brought it forth through the marriage of Hosea and the children that Hosea had with Gomer. And throughout his word, all 14 chapters, God has given reasons why there is so much calamity in the lifestyle of Ephraim. But yet for those that love him, those that dwell under the shadow of the Lord, you're blessed. Friends, you are blessed this morning because you love God. We'll be in Joel's gospel next. We are going to be taking all 12 of the minor prophets and uh, studying those and uh, how that we have finished the book of the Revelation and how that we are doing all 12 of the, of the minor prophets, how it corresponds with the book of the Revelation and how it will give a, a deeper meaning for those uh, that have a desire to study. We appreciate you. Thank you again for being a part of our Bible study this morning. We appreciate you and thank you again for your letters. Uh, keep them coming. Amen. Keep them cards and letters coming, uh, as they would say. Uh, it, it's, it's a blessing. We appreciate them. And we love you. We pray that something has been said this morning to help you. Uh, before we go, I want to make an announcement. Uh, on the 25th day of September, we will be having our Feast of Tabernacles service. And we will be having Holy Commune during that service. And it will be live. And if you would like to take part in that, we would love to have you. So uh, put it on your calendar. Uh, we will be our best to remind uh, again uh, that we will be having that. Uh, on the 25th of September. But uh, we appreciate you and thank you again for your prayers and your letters. Uh, until the next time, may the Lord richly bless.